for application services, leveraging his multidisciplinary skills to create value for clients. Welcome, Mr. Ramesh. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone in the back hear me? OK. Are you comfortable in the back? There's a lot of space out here. OK. So don't blame me if you can't see the slides properly. OK. So I think we are starting off today uh, on a very gloomy note outside. Uh, you know, last week I was in, uh, you know, earlier this week actually, looks like already long, I was in London for some meetings and uh, it was bright and shining and beautiful and I was bragging to my people out there that this looks like Bangalore <laughs> and today when I got out of home this morning it almost looked like London. <laughs> so nevertheless I think Ashish and company have uh, uh, had a beautiful uh, first day at the, uh, at, the, at the conference here and uh, hopefully uh, Lots of ideas and lots of uh, thoughts have been provoked. So I will try to add a little bit more fuel to the fire here. So the concept is about, you know, what can we do? What are those big things that we can do to be able to architect breakthrough customer experiences, right? Uh, and before we go on to understand how to create those experiences, we need to understand, let's sort of step back and look at what's happening around us. And so, uh, how do you even look at customers? What are their behaviors? What, what is changing around us? And so start looking at customer experiences in the context of those changes that are happening around us. OK? So I have a, I have a set of uh, uh, fresh new topics that are new studies. I've also, you know, over the last few uh, months, I've sort of I've sort of pulled together some of the curated things just for you, uh, some of the learnings that are most relevant that I have picked up, uh, and sort of trying to condense it and give it to you as, uh, as business analysis practitioners. So there are some videos which you can sort of look at. But I think the, to get started, Netflix's CEO, Reed, doesn't want us to even sleep. He thinks that his biggest competitor is human beings wanting to go and sleep for eight hours a day. So he wants to grab that amount of time. What does this mean to us? What it means to us is how competition is being perceived. He's not worried about uh, you know, YouTube. He's not worried about Time Warner, he's not worried about any gaming uh, you know, uh, competitors. He's more concerned about how does he get a share of the eight hours that human beings shut off from everything else. Right? He says, that's a big opportunity for me and Netflix. I got to figure out how I handle the situation. This is my opening statement because I want to open, and I just want to open up the whole conversation to go a little wider. And so we live in this world of liquid expectations. Accenture um, and, and you know we have Accenture has actually uh, acquired a company called Fjord, which is a specialist design firm. They joined together to create to conduct a survey on what is called as a love index. Love index and IT people, business people don't go together, right? You're supposed to be very grumpy, supposed to be self-centered, <laughs> worried about our things, worried about competition, paranoid, and things like that. But you know, when you look at this, uh, there was a question, what are customers, why, why do customers like certain brands and they don't like certain other brands? Okay? And what they came out was the concept of liquid expectations. And we'll talk about uh, that a little later. But it says, I'm sorry if you can't see this, it says, if I can pay seamlessly, uh, 
when, uh, when I take an Uber, why isn't it the same when I purchase my groceries? So if I can get a particular experience when I take Uber and groceries, why shouldn't I have the same experience when I, have, when I buy groceries or when I buy, buy furniture? So what is happening here? So why would a, a, a taxi company influence a grocery, a retailer? Something must be happening in behind, right? And what is happening behind is the fact that consumers' expectations are changing dramatically. And so in the earlier years, you know, this is an example of a bank, right? We actually, this is a slide which I used even last time, and it's even more uh, contextual now. Bank of America would, of America or Citibank would only worry about other banks in the past, right? These were direct competitors, the big, large ones, very much too large to fail, systemically important companies, right? But there are experiential competitors, right, who are influencing customer opinion and saying, look, if, if a PayPal and a Mint app and an Apple and a Venmo can give these sort of experiences, Bank of America or Citibank, why don't you? Why can't you? So Bank of America is actually pushed into certain initiatives, strategic initiatives, based on the agenda that the PayPals and the Venmos and Apple set. As though that's not enough, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the WhatsApp, and Ubers are dictating experiences for Bank of America, which is a traditional uh, you know, banking giant. So what is, why is this happening? And if, if that is happening, what happens to these large multinational corporations across, across the world? All these big, large companies that have built huge estates and huge assets, huge corporations, they must be a worried lot. Isn't it? And indeed they are. Because when you build such large assets and such large companies over multiple countries, it used to be, it used to last 40 years, 50 years, right? You build a huge behemoth, you run a ship for many years. So if you look at the early 50s and 60s, early 60s, you build a company that would last, you can say the average life, lifespan is around 60 years. So you could have a chairman, a CEO over 10 years, and you could have you know, three or four large uh, you know, initiatives over multiple business cycles. But look at what's happening today, right? A company which is at the top, it's supposed to be large, huge, cannot fail, you know, it has, cannot last more than 15 years at the top, there's something systemically wrong. <coughs> 15 years is <coughs> quite a short period. Excuse me. So 15 years at the top, and many of the Fortune 500 companies even perish from the map. They don't stay long enough. So what the, wh why is it so bad? Why is it so hard? Is it because they don't have products <clears throat> which are relevant for the market? Is it because the economic uh, ecosystem is so different that it demands certain things which is different from what they can deliver, even though they have been very successful businesses? Or is it something even more fundamental. Let's take Procter & Gamble, a company which has over 300 brands. And look at what's happening for those 300 brands, right? This is, though you can't read each one, but suffice to say, every brand of Procter & Gamble has 
two or three worthy competitors and a big Procter & Gamble brand itself is under huge pressure because each one of those brands have some worthy competitors that are proposing very different value propositions to their clients, to, the, to P&G's customers. And if you look at the consumer goods industry, there were some few dominant brands, right? Unilever, Procter & Gamble, and these large companies who dictate customer preferences. Remember what, what we, uh, do you remember the uh, Gillette example, as they say, right? Gillette makes a lot of money. In fact, uh, uh, the ad says this is what the best a man can get, or whatever, right? It started with one blade, two blades, three blades, four blades, five blades, and whatnot. And they made customers pay a lot of money. Okay? So on an average, uh, in the US, uh, a person, uh, in a month, you pay about $20 is the average cost for, for a shaving razor, right? And here comes a company called Dollar Shave. How many of you have heard of this company called Dollar Shave? Right? It came in and what did it do? What did it do? They changed the model. They converted it into a subscription-based uh, thing. They said, okay, no problem. I'll give you a, 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 a razor, which is as good. You subscribe to this service. Every month, you have for one dollar uh, a dollar shave, which comes and uh, you know lands at your, at your at your door every year and every month, and it's fine. You just subscribe for a year. And what did it do? It did everything what uh, PNG did, uh, Gillette didn't do. It doesn't it doesn't sell through retailers. It doesn't have any advertising. Uh, it the CEO works out of their warehouse literally, and. And um, there's no huge advertisement, no advertisement cost, no overheads. It's just that he says, I've shaved everything and passing it all back to you. So $20 and $1, the choices were quite clear. And by the way, dollar shave razors are pretty good. They are as good. Uh, may not be fancy, but as good. So, so when you have these sort of, and they are, and by the way, uh, Unilever bought it for 60 million or something of that sort and shaved. Uh, and, and you know, the, the CEO of Unilever was, was actually attacked. Why did you pay so much for such a small company? And you know what he said? I am buying this as a pilot because I believe each one of my brands is going to go down this particular model. I want to understand the subscription model so well so that I want to prepare for the future. Now that's the level of seriousness that one small company <laughs> did to a very, very established Gillette brand and made a large PNG or a Unilever sit up and look. Now, this sort of things are happening across all industries. The hotel industry, again, look at what Airbnb did. Look at what OYO is doing, right? So if you can deconstruct a value chain in a particular industry, and then reassemble it back, it gives you very, very different results. And that's what some of these uh, new players are doing. Established large hotel chains are scampering to give experiences that are very different. Talking of hotel chains, hotel chains are now saying, you know, all these stressed out corporate guys who come and stay in our, in our, in our hotels, they are saying, what's the best thing that we could do? You know, giving them huge luxuries and all which they don't use. You know, you go into the room late in the evening, you're so tired, you hit the bed. All you need is a good night's sleep. So they're beginning to focus on, can we give them a good night's sleep? And, and there is sleeping kits and things like that that are being provided. I saw some, read something like that in the news recently. So how can you deliver rich new customer experiences becomes the name of the game. This is happening in automobile. This is happening in a logistics company like FedEx, who are, uh, it's happening around in a bank. We talked about it. And so, what does it mean to be a big brand? Right? So, first one is 2006. 
if you look at 2006, the blue, the blue, uh, the circles are the ones where you have traditional businesses. So the traditional businesses actually dominated the top five brands, and it was only Microsoft in 2006, which used to be a top brand. Look at what happened in 2012, and look at 2017. The one in yellow are the tech, technology-driven businesses. The top five brands are technology-driven businesses. And if you look to the right, the top 25 brands, you can see a lot of yellows bubbling up. What does it say? It says there is an underlying wave of technology that is driving businesses and top brands. And, and, and as they say, right, serviceification of products and every company is a software company. Every company is a digital company. That is what is the underlying message of, of this. So if you want to be, if your company wants to be one of the top brands in the world, you better be very, very good with software and technology. Learn how to sort of dramatically use technology for your benefits. And by the way, five years from now, 2022, there will be very different change. We don't know how many of these will. So, so we look at um, top five things to get right. So, what are five things that we can do to get a frictionless customer experience or a high quality customer experience, right? I can think of a few, and I have some good examples to share with you. The first and foremost of all is to understand your customer very well. Um, and when you, when you understand a customer, it's understand and have deep understanding of what he or she wants, what is his journey, what does he like to do. Let me give you an example, a very personal example. So I invested um, in, a, in, a, in a unit linked insurance plan. Um, of one of the leading insurance companies. I'll try not to name them. But it's a, it's a symptom of what's happening everywhere. And many of you would have gone through this. So you sign up for that insurance. First you come. It takes enormous amount of time to even understand the product, right? I'm an insurance guy for 20 plus years. It takes me enormous amount of time and questioning. You have to almost like pulling teeth. You have to dig out the information that you need before you understand what are the policy charges? What are the funds underlying it? What are the returns? What is the net? You know, when you invest, what is the gain? Uh, what is the packaging versus what is real? What, does, uh, what is the impact of tax uh, when you invest and when you have to take it out? And finally, um, till when do you need to contribute? And if you have to exit the policy, what is the load and what, what are the impact of it, right? Most of these things are not told. You know, they ask you, ah, I'll give you 12% return, 13%, look at what is happening in the fund. It's all, all the rosy picture is painted. And then finally, you understand a lot of these things and then you sort of, you pick a plan. What happened to me after that was, I get a call saying, has this agent uh, XYZ explained this to you and do you understand everything? First of all, I don't know what is everything. <laughs> has he explained, has there been any misstatement to your, in your opinion? If I were, will I ever sign up? <laughs> so what is, state, what is truth and what is misstatement? How would I ever know? And then I get a call. So then I say no, you know, I asked a lot of questions and I believe what what you guys have said is right, and I'll pick it up. Okay, sir, thank you. Thank you for your call. This is a confirmation call. Then I get, after a, a couple of days, I get another call that is from his boss, saying, hey, I'm calling from the branch, from HDFC Life. I, this is a verification call. I said, okay, what is a verification call? Have you uh, applied for a policy recently? I said, yes. Can you confirm your date of birth? I said, what? Can you confirm your date of birth? I want to confirm. I said, how, 
why should I give personal details to somebody who's saying this from life insurance? There's absolutely no, no thinking. You just give a call whenever, you know. Uh, so you don't even appreciate where your customer is, what sort of a situation he's in. I get five, six such calls. And after that, it is passed on to a third party administrator, right? to, to your call center. And imagine those people are at you day and night after you. Sir, have you taken the policy? I want you to confirm these things. Right from date of birth to policy amount, the quota, 15 digit policy number say, can you confirm this is right? Your proposal number? I said, come on, I'm in a meeting. <laughs> Get on with it. So it's such a harried experience. And after that, it's passed on to a medical test. Now, that's another third party agency which schedules a medical appointment. They are after you after that. Unbelievable. And sometimes you really feel, is this an investment or <laughs> what is this? How much of time is being wasted? And then the, the experience of buying a policy and investing is completely lost. You know, the more and more I transact with that company, the more and more I get very offended. Uh, almost to the point that you know, I must call up the chairman and have a, a briefing, give him a dressing down sort of a thing, right? But everyone along the chain says, why are you doing this to me? They said, sir, this is the process. I can't help it. I'm sorry. I understand it's painful for you, but I'm sorry. I can't do anything about it. Now, imagine everybody knows it is painful. Everybody knows that you are inflicting enormous pain on your client. But you're doing nothing about it. And some of us must have even designed those systems and processes. So that's a food for thought. And I'm sure each one of you are going through this. Is this what you want a customer? Is this frictionful experience or frictionless experience? And imagine it's for one policy, how many times we have to invest. But this is true of most investments that you go through. Enormous checks and balances. In the same company, once I, had, I said, I'm, I want to shut down the policy. Enough. It's not giving me the returns. OK, you know, again, I had three hierarchies of people calling me. And then finally said, sir, you have to come to the bank. You have to come to, the, uh, to our office. Uh, I, I had even the banking. And by the way, the, the bank actually was the channel partner. The bank manager, everybody called, sir, continue the policy. No, 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 I, I'm done. They said, OK, we'll, we'll do all these things, but you need to come to the uh, insurance branch. Why? They, they want to make sure that uh, you're the right person. I said, look, you and 15 people have you, my salary account is with you. All my other investments are with you. I'm alive. I'm not dead. Right? I'm signing. You have come and talked to me. No, sir, but that's our process. You've got to come. So I went. After two, two twice, I went. And all it was, you just go there, sit in that outside veranda sort of a room. They sign a bunch of uh, forms. And said, now you can go. I said, what did you accomplish by getting me to sign at this place? No, we want to make sure that there are no other uh, you know, hanky-panky things happening. So, so are you sure I am the Ramesh that you are looking for? Sir, as per process, we are done. So now you can go, sir. So and without batting an eyelid, they will pick up a check from you. <laughs> but after that, put you through all this pain. So, so just imagine, just think about when we as business analysts, we have to design processes and design systems. How much of pain are we inflicting on clients? I want to show you. OK. I want to show you a, a company called Lemonade. How many of you have heard of this insurance company called Lemonade? Yeah? This company called Lemonade actually went out to set up Really disgusted with some of these experiences. I wish I can set up a company too. Uh, went out and said, look, this is just too much. We want to start up a company, completely new experiences, go back to the roots of why insurance companies have been, um, the reason why insurance companies have even come up. And let's set it up afresh. And let's use technology completely. So let's listen to this. This is not the one. This one. this one. Okay. 
just give you a minute, please. No. Yeah. Um, I so think it's almost self-evident that there's something profoundly broken in the world of insurance. Um, there's plenty of evidence, but as I say, it's almost self-evident. So um, there's a reservoir of ill will towards insurance companies. Um, in the US, most Americans perceive insurance as a necessary evil rather than a social good, which is kind of shocking because it could be the ultimate social good. It's a community taking care of people in distress, but no, that's not the perception at all. 25% um, of Americans, when surveyed, say it's okay to defraud insurance companies. The other 75% were brought up better than to admit that kind of thing to strangers. Um, <laughs> so you've got an industry <coughs> wh which has got, um, which is one of the most disliked sectors um, out there. So I, I think, as I say, the, the notion that there's something profoundly broken is almost not in, uh, up for debate. The question becomes, what are the root causes? And that's really the key to how do you resolve them? And from our perspective, there are two structural issues in insurance today, and that's really why Lemonade is rebuilding itself as an insurance carrier, because we don't think that you can simply parachute down some kind of technological solution on an existing infrastructure when the problems are structural. And I'll try and touch on them briefly, but um, the first and the easiest one to um, chat through is, th is um, the legacy. So in the US, almost 10% of the Fortune 500 is insurance companies, 40-something companies out of the 500. The average age is 95 years old. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, but <laughs> um, what you're talking about is a corporate structure that is really the byproduct of the Industrial Revolution. So these are companies that were best practices, no doubt, at the time of their establishment, but those best practices are no longer true today in the era of the sharing economy and the internet. And it's incredibly difficult to reinvent yourself when the seas change. So um, State Farm uh, um, has 18,000 brokers. What do you do? How do you reinvent yourself as a direct consumer when you've got that kind of albatross around your neck? So I think the first one is simply the corporate structure and it's the general broad innovator's dilemma of how do you adjust behemoth, huge institutions with tens of thousands of, of uh, employees, how do you adjust them when the winds change as dramatically as they have? So that's the first structural issue. The second one is, I think, more um, subtle and more insidious, and that is the business model. Uh, and this is really a big part of what we're trying to take a run at. So at the risk of being a little bit uh, provocative, hyperbolic, or facetious, <laughs> insurance makes money by denying claims. There is a, a profound conflict of interest at the very core of the insurance business model. So if I'm the insurance company and you're making a claim, every dollar that I pay you is a dollar less to my bottom line. Conflicts of interest don't get... So I think this is, this is one of the root cause of of being completely in conflict with your, as an industry, it's at conflict with your customer. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So you're the, at, at, at the conflict with your customer's interests, which is, which is very sad. That's where you know, insurance, which was started off as pooling of the risks for the greater good and for the main social cause is lost. And it's about how can you deny claims and be profitable. And number two, they say about 25% of Americans don't bat an eyelid before you put in a false claim. It's perfectly normal. And I think that number could be even more elsewhere, if not lesser. So well-educated, well, it's okay, perfectly all right to go and put in a false claim and draw something out of an insurance company. Because you know what, they squeeze you anyway, right? Why is this happening? And so uh, the, the, the the story is that Lemonade started off an insurance company completely bypassing all the norm, norms. They started off in New York, started off in a few states, uh, uh, you know, providing home insurance and, and auto insurance. And finally, uh, their objective is, uh, you know, use completely, you know, on an app. There are no agents. There's no mis-selling. May use conversational AI and, and analytics to be able to sell insurance in a very seamless way. And also, when you have to pay a claim, all you need to do is actually take a 
picture, photograph of the, uh, of the loss, and talk into the play, into the, into the phone. Uh, and they use facial recognition techniques, fraud detection. They use an enormous amount of technology to make it painless, absolutely painless for the client. And they, they set a world record of paying a claim. Anybody knows? How long does it take you know, when you set up, when you, when you uh, lodge a claim to the time it gets settled? Have any of you uh, preferred a claim with an insurance company? Six months? Yeah, 30 to 45 days. But you know, Lemonade's first claim was settled for in three seconds. Three seconds. Even without the, the claims officer said, I was driving in the car when the first claim was settled. Okay, so of course, clients will love that sort of an experience, right? So they worked for years together designing and taking out all the frictions, friction away from client experience. And, and there's an app you can download, and I would, I would recommend you look at the website of Lemonade and see there are some wonderful apps that's going around. Um, some analyst calls Lemonade the Uber of insurance, by the way. Uh, and people who have visited my room will see that I have dissected their business model uh, using a business model canvas and trying to understand how this will evolve. I'm a big fan of Lemonade as of now. Uh, give you another example. How many of you really could imagine that Amazon, which started off selling books, is the biggest retailer today? In India, it's a big retailer. Can you look at uh, US, right? It is bigger than all the big retailers put together, and even more. Is it possible to grow so big, Walmart? Why? Why do you think they have grown this big? What is it that they have done that others couldn't do? Oh, sorry. I shouldn't be. You have this. No, man, not this one. I have some. So we'll, we'll, we'll hear what Jeff uh, has to say on what is it that sort of distinguishes services, uh, Amazon. Okay. Some people I'll yeah. just pull only that particular clip for that, that idea what we need. Is some people see you as an e-commerce yeah. company or a retailer. Others see you as Audio an innovative please. tech company. You have Amazon Web Services and you have original content and you have uh, uh, Alexa and so many other things. How should we be thinking about Amazon? Yeah, I do get, uh, uh, that, that is uh, something that people get confused about sometimes. What is Amazon? We do su such a diverse array of things uh, from producing original content at Amazon Studios to uh, Amazon Web Services uh, where we sell, you know, startups and enterprises, you know, computing infrastructure uh, to the things that most people know about, which is our, our consumer offering uh, where we deliver things in little brown boxes. And these things seem so disparate. How is it that we're doing all of them? And the common thread, and really what it is, is it's an approach. We have a very distinctive approach um, that we have been honing and refining and thinking about for 22 years. And it's really just a few principles um, that we use as we go about these activities. The, at the very top of the list is one I've already mentioned, but you'll probably hear it 10 times throughout tonight because it's so central, and it is customer obsession. It's customer obsession instead of, for example, competitor obsession, or business model obsession, or product obsession, or technology obsession. There are many ways to center a business. And, um, and by the way, 
many of them can work. I know um, and, and, and have friends who lead very competitor-obsessed companies, and those companies can be successful. You know, that's not a bad strategy. Um, you have to be really good at close following. You uh, identify winners when you watch, you watch your competitors very carefully. If they latch on to something that's working, you duplicate it as quickly as possible. It's a very good strategy in some ways because you don't have to go down blind alleys um, if you're not pioneering, if you're only close following. It has some advantages. But it has some disadvantages too. And um, I like the customer obsession model. I think it's the right one. I think it's better than product obsession even. I think product obsession is not bad, but I think customer obsession gets you there in a healthier way. Um, uh, so that's one of, the, uh, one of the principles, one of the approaches that we take in every single thing that we do. The second one is that we are uh, willing, I would say even eager, to invent and pioneer. So that is, um, I think that goes along, it marries really well with customer obsession. Customers are always dissatisfied, they, even when they don't know it, even when they think they're happy, they actually do want a better way and they just don't know yet what that should be. And that's why I always warn people, customer obsession is not just listening to customers. Customer obsession is also inventing on their behalf because it's not their job. Yeah. So, so here is an alternate model to think, right? Customer obsession. Uh, it's not just about listening to what is told, but going behind what is stated to look for their needs. Customers may still be happy, but there, there is always a latent need for something even better. So I leave you as business analysts with this thought that when you're designing customer experiences, what would, you, what would you design for? What would you be looking out for? So that sort of takes us to the next topic on what is the next thing to get right? So as you design, as you design customer experiences, um, design touch points. Every look at every touch point that can delight your customers, right? Uh, and not the HD, uh, not the sort of the insurance examples that we talked about. And there are there are many hated industries that many hated. So every time you have uh, you have to design a thing. Start looking at how would your customer feel? What is that person? Who is your customer? And what is he or she feeling when he is using this, uh, this touch point, right? So look for how this is, a, this is a journey line. How many of you are conversant with this design thinking method, customer journey map? OK, excellent. I'm glad to see a lot of hands. But start getting into the shoes of your customer and experience the emotion, experience the pain, experience the pleasure of what the customer is going through as he goes through his journey of either when he's uh, you know, working, he, he's in touch with, you, with your company or with your product or service. Uh, and think of how can you elevate that? How can you elevate that? Identify moments of truth which you can influence in an extremely positive or negative way. And look at how you can uplift the experiences of customers. Let me give you a reason. How many of you use WhatsApp? Isn't it 100%? Why is that? Why do you think? It is not there five years ago. Why do you use WhatsApp? Adoption. Necessity. Oh, without, without WhatsApp, we never lived life. Great, yeah, it's become necessity. Convenience, simple to use. Free, fantastic. How do you feel when you use WhatsApp? Pain. <laughs> Pardon? Host? Forced to use it. Why, why are so many people using WhatsApp? What is that underlying feeling that it's trying to ride on? Share. Connect. Real time. So easy. You know, how can you stay connected with a lot of people? Your family, your friends, your groups. How many of you, okay, another, 
how many of you are part of at least 10 groups? All. It says something, doesn't it? There is a sense. How many times we have seen children using it, adults using it, men using it, women using it, housewives, uh, working women. You know, you, you talk every strata of society, small businesses, everybody is using it. Why? And they're loving it. A cobbler uses it, a furniture repair guy uses it, he takes a foot and sends it back. That becomes a specification. There is some reason, right? And just look at what are the adoption rates. First four years of growth, we just beat everyone. There must be a reason. But the underlying reason, according to me, is there is something nice when you use WhatsApp. It connects to an underlying feeling that if I see something good, I want to share it with my family. I want to share it with my friends. I want to share a joke. I want lighthearted. When I, you go look for you know, new things, the amount of connection with your, with, with your people and with your um, groups is enormous. How many of you have become part of your alumni network after WhatsApp? Isn't it? Fabulous feeling every time you go and meet people. So can you design processes and touch points that make your customers and your clients happy? There is something innate in us to connect with people. So there are many such human values that makes it innate in us. Can you tap into that innate human nature of wanting to do something and create the experiences and touch points around that? That's the challenge for us. Let's take experience of gaming. How many of you are gamers? Serious gamers? How many of you are anti-gamers with your kid? <laughs> That's the other thing, right? So actually, I have a visual which talks about the good parts, the first part and second part. of. There are people who argue why gaming you know, uh, is good for your brain and keeps you sharp. My son, actually, I always, the only thing I fight with my son is because of this. He argues on this, he's on this side, and I'm on the other side. By the way, he's decided to give up gaming till his 12 standard exams are over, so we've st struck a compromise. But most parents are aghast. Why don't they get it? He spent two hours or three hours on a game, and he says, Can you, don't you know I just spent 20 minutes every time? You know, next time I'm going to use stopwatch. He never uses it. But where is 20 minutes and where is two hours or three hours? How is it that you lose track of time when you are into gaming? There is something happening. Right? There is something very deeply into the way human beings are built. It touches that chord. Right? So can we build experiences? I'm not sitting in judgment on what is right and what is wrong. But can we design experiences, customer experiences, that goes with the natural flow of human beings, that you don't have to push them through? Right? Food for thought. So let's move on. So design touching touch points that customers love doing, so you don't have to push through. And we saw the, and I would say use technology heavily. And technology has actually helped in great ways to give us some of those wonderful experiences. How many of you track technology trends? Almost all of us, great. So I would recommend you look into this site. This, this deck will be available to you, futurism.com. It gives you technology trends for the next 20, 30 years. Now, whether all of them will play out, we don't know. But very clearly gives you a peek into what technology does and what and how you can use it. It gives you a good set of things that you can play with when you're designing experiences. Okay? Um, but let me give you an example of what, oh, sorry, I already have this up, so can you go to that education? So we have an example of how technology can dramatically change our lives going forward, right? Um, I have a video of uh, how you can use mixed reality uh, 
and dramatically change medical education, and dramatically change medical education in ways that can help us lead much better lives, and we can reduce the amount of experiments, doc no doctors here, right? Doctors have on patients, the number of experiments. Uh, yes, we are in a hospital premises, right? I should be careful. But uh, the amount of experiments on what it could be and what sort of, uh, uh, you know, medication is sent. Yeah, that's the one. So this is an example of The HoloLens is absolutely the most amazing piece of technology. Within five seconds, I realized that the world had changed. It was an immediate realization that this is something exciting and we have to be a part of this. Seeing things in 3D is something that you could do before with some glasses. The thing that the HoloLens gives you is the ability to walk around those 3D objects and to really experience them as if they're in the room with you. It is augmented reality, it is mixed reality. And what that means is I still see you, I still see this room and everything around me, but the digital content is inserted into the room as if it's actually there. As a teacher, I can see what they're all looking at. And that's something that we think has real power. It's actually opening up our interactions with each other. The biggest drive is getting the anatomy curriculum completely done by the time we move into the new health education campus. Today, we and the Cleveland Clinic are constructing a state of the future health education campus. Our students will learn using the most forward-looking educational programs. HoloLens is a key part of this. The actual act of dissection hasn't changed in generations. We have to be much, much more effective and efficient. The biggest thing about medical school is there's just so much information and so much knowledge you're being asked to learn. HoloLens is going to enable us to teach in an integrated way and to look at the body in ways they haven't been able to see it. It's sort of having x-ray vision, seeing through the skin. My mind was just kind of blown when I tried it on. It was perfect. It's really hard to understand what the anatomy and book's trying to tell you. So with the HoloLens, we can literally show you what's happening with the body. We can look at how the heart moves or look at how the brain processes information and how information flows around in our brain. They can see when the heart valves are closing and hear the sounds. How the diaphragm moves, when the lungs move, a click of the fingers is gonna allow students to see how everything's interconnected in the body. We have means to draw people's attention to things to get them where they need to look. Do you want to look and then pull the bones out? What they really crave is learning anatomy in the context of what they need to know clinically. What are they gonna need to know for their clerkships and their future career? Yeah, so just gives you a, gives you a sense that Technology can be used in ways that can dramatically change education. This is an example of medical education, but I would say business education, how many of us, before we walked into our first job, really understood what was going on in a bank or what was happening in an insurance company or what was happening in an automotive business? My son even continues to be 17 years old. He says, what do you do the whole day? Why are you so busy? What do you do? What do you go and do? They have no clue, you know, and can't understand what you do for eight to 12 hours a day. And you're so busy, right? And that's education. It doesn't give us a sense of what, what's happening around in the world. And then you're, you get out of college and drop into the real world and you figure things out by mumbling and bumbling around, right? So, uh, and this happens in every, every sphere of activity and technology can dramatically make uh, you know, our life's different. Uh, we have similar examples of big data, and I sort of uh, skipped that in the interest of time. Um, finally, 10, 20 years ago, if you have to go and buy a book, or if I want to buy uh, a piece of furniture, it was straightforward, easy. I'd go to a bookshop, Go look for what titles, pick up a book, come back home. 
Today, if I have to buy a book, you know the number of people who influence me. So it's very similar. Each one of us, in every sphere of what we buy, uh, understanding who is influencing this behavior. And there's just too many factors that are influencing consumer behavior. And if you're looking at consumer experiences, it's, it becomes very naive to think that, you know, by just putting one advertisement out here, uh, your customers will buy. I think you've got to look at a complete picture of all the influences who are impacting your client's customer behavior and start thinking of applying them. I just want to give you a quick snapshot of this. This is difficult to read, but I would encourage you to go and look at this. This is social media. Social media has given a voice to everyone, and there are hundreds and hundreds of ways by which social media is impacting our lives. Sometimes it's very scary. And many of these social media is just one form. Uh, and I also talked earlier about love index, right? When you think of what makes, you, what makes somebody like your brand, right? Why do they want to love your brand? This is the result of the, uh, the, the, the study that I talked about, right? Um, across industries and across brands, they say, why we like these brands is because it's fun. It's relevant to me, right? It's engaging identifies with the individual needs and wants, right? You engage the person relevant to the particular need and the situation and context they are in. Social, it connects me to people and each other. Remember WhatsApp? And finally, it's helpful. Somebody said it's easy, it's convenient. And just a flick of a button, I can communicate messages that was very, very hard for me to do. I had to pick up a phone call or go and meet a person. I can just send messages and keep keep him at the top of my thoughts, right? So five dimensions of master, uh, uh, measuring customers' feelings. I would encourage you to go and look up the Accenture site where this study is out there. Um, and then you know, think of how you, if you want to engage your customers and you want your clients to be able to love you, love your brand, uh, what can we do and how can we bring those customer experiences uh, back uh, how can we design for those experiences in, for your clients? Finally, uh, you know, we have all, over the years, uh, built, to, built products and services to earn profits. We want to make money. Being rich is, is a fad thing. Making money for the company is good. Quarter after quarter, after every earnings call, we feel good that we have been able to do that. But is that all? Or is that what customers want? If you look at, uh, you know, there's a technology vision. Um, and for the first time, I'm not, I haven't heard this elsewhere, and so I don't want to be a Accenture uh, uh, storyteller here. But this is Accenture's technology vision. In Accenture.com, you'll find it. But for the first time in so many years, a technology vision is putting people in the center of technology. It says, people first, for the people, and by the people. And every experience that is being, and even all the technology trends that are coming out, is looking at how to put people in the middle of, uh, in, in the center of everything. Um, it took some time for me to sort of get to this thing. Uh, but I would encourage, why is, why are people in the middle of all of this? Why artificial intelligence is the new AI, ecosystem and power plays? The workforce, what is the future of workforce? And how people are, you have to design for people and for humans, and then look at the uncharted territory. Um, what this tech vision gives us is trying to connect back to people, connect back to what matters to people and for people whom, for whom we are designing this. There's another uh, video here. Uh, it's very similar to the insurance video. Oscar Health is a fintech company in the health insurance space. Uh, the CEO there goes on to say, say that, look, when my wife was pregnant and I had to take her to NHS, uh, I had to take her to the public health system in the US, 
I went through such a pain, undertaking, you know, put me through the hospitals and the clinics, etc. As a patient, that we spend 15% of the country's GDP goes to healthcare, and this is the raw deal that we get from healthcare system, right? And he sort of motivated to set out to change that experiences, and he set up a company which sort of advises people on the right plans to choose, the right ways to get to, and demystifying all the problems, and then help them. Uh, through this journey. And there he makes out a case on why the health insurance industry is completely broken and needs to be changed. And from a customer experience standpoint, you got to get this uh, fixed, okay? So some of you, I'm sure, uh, are motivated by such. Uh, dare, to, dare to think beyond what your current process or your current situation to what's the state of the industry. And like the uh, lemonades and Oscars of the world, when you're looking at it, think of experiences and think of the, the, the larger cause that, uh, that is, that's being supported. And that leads us to, as analysts, what would you design for and what would your requirements document look like? Is it about responding back to what your client stated or all the five things that we talked about just now? Finally, to wrap it up, Friends, you know, when you're engaging customers, these are practical tips for you. You know, when you're engaging customers and you're engaging work clients, look for immersion workshops, not a question answer session, but immerse, get yourself immersed in your client situation, in the client processes. Look at the good and bad, look at all the stakeholders, immerse your client in a solution and get their experiences out before you design and as you design processes. Um, Keep the client, your customer's client in focus as you do this. Everything else, products, competition, you talked about many of those things, can come next. Design thinking is one of the wonderful things that's happening around in the world where it gives you lots of tools and techniques to design new ways of doing things. I would say embrace design thinking, and I'm glad Ashish and uh, many of our friends uh, are are uh, in this business of helping business analysts do design thinking. Last workshop, the whole last convention was on design thinking, and I see quite a few hands now at least conversant with it. I would say embrace design thinking completely because that's what's going to help you think outside the box and look at it from all the 360 degrees. The other thing is, you know, uh, and this is my call to Ashish, uh, I haven't spoken to him about this, but I would say, can this, session that we conduct the BA convention, be people with multidimensional capabilities and multifunctional skills. Can we open this up to multifunctional skills? Because the, 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 the body of business analysis is not restricted only to business analysts. And that's where the world is headed. And can we now begin to design conventions and body of knowledge and sharing with multidisciplinary teams in because you have something to learn from everyone and as a business analysis practitioner, can you master the skill of learning from every specialist and still be able to capture that and design, it, design customer experiences for your clients? And so can you build a network, your personal network in LinkedIn, which has multi-specialists from different fields and not just business analysis? Understand and leverage technology, I think that's pretty much well understood. But finally, I want to leave you with this fact about uh, anchoring on human values. Uh, there was one other uh, video I wanted to show, but it's there in my deck you can pick up. Uh, it is about the, the founder of iPod, the guy who actually uh, designed iPod, and then he founded Nest as a company. If you know, it's, a thermost it's, a, it's, a kind of, it's like a thermostat. It works with IoT device in the US and very popular. He sold it out to go to uh, Google uh, recently. And uh, he says, you know, every day I, I, I wake up in the morning and uh, I, I wake up in cold sweat, you know, wondering what did I bring, uh, what we brought to this world, you know? Uh, we, we brought this iPhone and all these personal devices. It has made people, in some ways, too self-centered. Uh, disconnected, you have the earlier generation completely disconnected from that, and the next generation completely with devices, they're self-centered, 
they cannot connect to a social cause. Um, and then he has an appeal to the world of designers saying, look, this is unintended consequence of the design. And I would recommend that you read that uh, article. And then he calls out to the, to the designer saying, can we design something more for the social good that is sustainable in the longer run? And can we stop making profits from making people narcissistic? Okay, so that's a very provocative article. But I want to sort of leave you back with this thing on human values, something which is uh, on a, uh, that can sustain over a period of time. Uh, and finally, with this thought. True happiness for you and your clients will come by leading a meaningful life, paying attention to human values, and cultivate that inner peace that we are looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ramesh. Customer understanding, designing customer touch points, technology, buying behavior, connecting to a cause. That was very wonderful presentation. Thank you.